Hi, my name is Denise Thomas and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I am the Chief of Staff at, at Cisco Meraki. And for those of you that don't know what we do, Cisco Meraki builds intelligent cloud managed IT and with the sole purpose of simplifying powerful technology so that businesses and schools and community organizations and governments of all sizes can really focus on their missions. So our solutions are deployed in, in, in over 1.6 million networks, which means that we're connecting over 100 million client devices every single day. So not a small feat. And that's maybe why they're so happy, because they're like, look at what we're doing all the time. Uh, we're really excited to be a part of this conversation with the Commonwealth Club and to be a part of tonight's conversation around women in the workplace. Uh, for those of you that are new to the study, it's a study that, that McKinsey and LeanIn.org do on an annual basis. And, and the goal of the study is to shed a little bit of light on the current state of women and Gen gender and race and sexual orientation and kind of how folks are experiencing the, the modern workplace. And, and for us, we wanted to be a part of this conversation because we actually think it's really important to have these conversations and that nothing can really change about how people experience their work if we aren't real and thoughtful about how people come to work every single day. Uh, I don't know how many of you been, have been to the, the House of Representatives, but it feels like we should probably make mention of one of the most diverse groups that are heading there this time around. Um, but, but walking into the chambers, there is a quote, and, and it says, to venture into the wilderness, one must see it not as it is, but as it will be. We want this conversation to not only be about kind of what people are currently experiencing today, but we want this conversation to be about what we really want to be. How we want to build these environments, environments that will actually work for all. So as we're thinking about the conversation today and as you're thinking about your questions for the panelists, yeah, the data is important because it informs the actions that we should take going forward, but the data is important because it helps us build a vision and a plan for what we should have in our future and what kind of organizations we can build. So we are super excited at Cisco and Cisco Meraki to be a part of this conversation and to be able to support this the club and all the vital topics like this one that they, they continue to encourage us to be having because being in conversation means that we can be in action. Uh, and so without further ado, because you did not come here to hear me or my cheering squad, um, I, I do want to go ahead and introduce our, our panel. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Alexis Kirkovich is a partner in McKinsey's financial services practice. She's a managing partner of McKinsey and Company Silicon Valley office, and she's the co-author of the 2018 Women in the Workplace report. She has been busy. Um, Sukinder King Cassidy, Singh Cassidy is president of StubHub and founder of the Board List, and our moderator Sarah Lacey is founder of Pando and Chairman Mom. Without further ado, let's get a big round of applause um, and welcome our panel to the Inform stage. Good evening and welcome to Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Sarah Lacey, the founder of Chairman Mom, and tonight it's my pleasure to host tonight's conversation focused on the 2018 Women in the Workplace recently released by McKinsey and LeanIn.org. Please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight, Alexis Krivkovich, managing partner of McKinsey & Company's Silicon Valley office, leader, financial services practice, McKinsey & Company, and co-author of the report, along with Sukinder Singh Cassidy, president of Subhub, founder and chairman of the board list. Uh, you guys can also find the report at womeninTheWorkplace.com. We'll be talking about a lot of aspects about it tonight and what should we, we should all be doing to address these outcomes and force those around us who didn't come here tonight to address these outcomes. <laughs> um, so lots to talk about. Let's get started. Um, so Alexis, I want to start with you as the author of this report, which in some ways is um, shocking but not surprising. I mean, the top line is nothing has really substantively changed. In the four years, you guys in LeanIn.org have been giving us data, making this data-based argument in the headquarters of what is supposed to be a data-centric industry. 
Nothing has changed. One of my, we're gonna drill down on a lot of things about the study. One of my favorite things is you guys did it with leanin.org and basically proved that leaning in wasn't the problem. You say in the study, women are asking for raises, women are asking for promotions, they are not leaving the industry in greater numbers than men. Women are not the problem. <laughs> you have taken my punchline. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so we started this because we said, okay, everybody talks about diversity. Everyone says diversity is important, uh, but clearly it's a complex issue because folks aren't cracking it. My least favorite question is just tell me the one thing I need to go do. And I always I don't know, <laughs> hire women and people of color. <laughs> <laughs> well, hire, yes, hire, but then keep it, you know, keep it moving, right? So that's, that's really what we saw. The first year we did the report, we said, well, how far off are we? What's it going to take on current course and speed to get there? And the answer was 100 years. And I turned to my team and I said, no, that can't be right. Like, build a better model, you know, <laughs> this is not appropriate. And they came back and they said, it's 200 years, it's 342, it's and I said, stop, or it's like asymptotic, right? But the short answer is we're not seeing that acceleration that everyone thought. And the common narrative, which says, you know, it's because women don't want it, it's because they're dropping out. It's simply not true in the numbers. In fact, what we see is attrition is not the driver. Women are there. They're showing up. They are leaning in, but they're not. They have more degrees. Mm -hmm. They graduate yeah. every of the past 30 years. Women have graduated with more college degrees, but they're coming into the workforce at similar levels. They're not progressing. They're getting stuck, and it happens really early. In fact, the very first promotion is the least equitable for every 100 men who moves forward, only 79 women do. And for women of color, 60. That disparity alone sets up a whole pipeline and pathway. Yeah, it's like compound misogyny over the course of your <laughs> career. We all get lectured about compound interest and how at 20 you should put money in your 401k. <laughs> this is compound misogyny. I feel like this needs to be next year's report. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just aiming for the next highlight reel. Um, so Kinder, You've been a phenomenal female leader in Silicon Valley for a long time. And if people don't know you, that just speaks to the misogyny in the press because because you are such a you run StubHub. You also created the board list, which helps basically take out the cop out of we can't put women on boards because, oh, we don't know any women qualified to be on boards. <laughs> um, I'm curious from your point of view, both as a leader and an organizer, are you surprised that We've given the industry, not only the tech industry, all industries, four or five years of data, and these data-driven industries haven't done anything with it. Um, I'm disappointed more than surprised, mm -hmm. right? You're disappointed because we all think of ourselves as rational decision makers. And the truth is the world falls back to patterns pretty easily, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's what we're dealing with, right? You can put all of the data forward. I mean... It's not just gender. Look at climate change. I mean, you can put forward all the data and people fall back to the familiar existence. You know, what's comfortable? Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, in the day-to-day -day of everything that we've got going on, to stop and change a pattern and a way of thinking is really, really difficult, right? Um, so I wish I could say I was disappointed. I wish I could say I was surprised. I'm more disappointed than surprised because I think what we're dealing with is a pretty freaking hard nut. And I mean, be honest. when you look at the numbers, they're, they're so bad. I mean, particularly as a female founder, you know, once again, we had all of these female and female led initiatives last year. And once again, female CEOs get 2.2% of the venture capital that's raised. It is a pretty brutal existence. I'm a masochist. All right. So um, <laughs> there's a line in this survey that this study that I want to ask you about Alexis and I understand like you guys are McKinsey and company so you phrase things in nicer ways than I do <laughs> but you say we know that many companies are committed in taking action how do you know that and what gives you that confidence because again we've been giving company data for four plus years um, you mentioned later in the survey that 76% articulate a business case, but only 13% have taken the critical next step 
of calculating what that actual positive impact on the business would be. Only 38% have even set targets for gender representation, just 10% when it comes to women of color. And how any of us who've ever been at a company think anything is gonna happen without even a target set. Like, where do you look at this data and think companies are committed to taking action? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should just get up and like walk around. <laughs> You're I not going to have any I answers here. Gonna like, I'm less like, trying to talk about your own report, and I'm more trying like to hope there's something I missed in here that's a silver lining. <laughs> well, so this is the bind we're in, right? Which is that companies actually do feel, I believe legitimately, like they have been making efforts. They already feel fatigued, and there's no progress yet. Yeah. So we're in this situation where we already feel exhausted and yet we're just getting out of the starting gate, which is why we believe so strongly you have to look at the data, you have to break it down, and you have to start asking yourself, okay, something about the way I've been doing it just simply is not working. And what we see in the gap is the stated intent that a lot of companies have. Over 90% of companies now say gender diversity is a top priority. Even that number has moved up dramatically just in the past five years. Great. Less than 50% of employees, when asked, agree that gender diversity is a top priority for their company because they don't see the day-to-day -day actions that mm -hmm. suggest that that stated desire is actually happening in reality in the moments that matter to them. Right? And 20% of employees will say it's lip service. And so for most companies, what they're trying to do or what they think they maybe are already achieving, what you know, women and men are saying when they look around the moments in their day to day, they're saying it, it doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. So I do believe there's genuine desire. I don't believe yet that most companies have found ways to express that uh, for employees to see real time. And I think you hit on a really important example, which is this point about targets. Mm -hmm. We are so uncomfortable in this country talking about what it'd look like to set targets on something like diversity because we think of quotas, right? right? And so we immediately reflexively move away. But every executive talk to, I say, look, you know, if you were having a meeting about cost and you said, I need you to deliver to me yeah. cost, and you say, great, what do you need this year? Meh, whatever Do your you best. Can do. Do your best. <laughs> I mean, what would you get in the average American company? Right. right. You get very little. You get incremental change. And when it comes to diversity, that's precisely what we do. We do not tell people how far, how fast they need to run. And it's no surprise as a result, we get very little change. And I mean, this is a societal thing. And one of the things that I wanted to get into in this conversation is, you know, if we care about fixing this problem, um, which I assume people in this room at least do, you know, how much of that is going to come down to policy? How much of that is going to come down to society and employees demanding it, as we've seen increasingly in Silicon Valley? How much of it is going to come down to, you know, enlightened, uh, enlightened despots of these companies who happen to be leading the way? I mean, I, I, you know, I think what we've seen is that data alone, data is great because it gives us a talking point and gives us a cudgel, but it doesn't move people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Sukinder, you've been really involved recently with this new law that was passed by California where you got to have women's on boards. And you know what? Everyone hates quotas. But if you travel around the world and you, you go to the countries that are the top of the economist glass ceiling index, quotas is how they got there. Uh, so I am in violent agreement that data alone will not get it done. And repercussions work. Disruption works. Um, and so you, you sort of point to the new law here in California or, in fact, in Europe. And while people hate thinking about quotas, the reality is there is a repercussion, right? Um, there's sort of other countries that have, you know, uh, explain or comply, right? I mean, those types of things, which are one short of a quota, but they're pretty damn close. Uh, we see institutional shareholders who say they're going to start voting you know, against companies that don't have diverse boards, as an example. And so the reality is, before you can change an attitude, you have to change the behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, because attitudes are a lot harder to change. But to answer your question, does data alone change behavior? Not if there's no repercussion on the other side. Not if there, you know, and we all wish, I wish, I wish I could say to my teams, to your point, can everybody just try harder to, like, bring costs down 10%? Yeah. You know, just, like, gosh darn it, let's try. And we're <laughs> going to end up where we end up. You know, 
I can tell you, like, it just wouldn't happen. It's the same as if, you know, my CEO was to say to me, you know, if I was, you know, Sue Kinder, can you just do better, please? And eBay's profits will soar as a result of that, do better, please. I mean, without a target, you know, or something that I'm on the hook for, it doesn't just naturally happen. And so I do think people, making people accountable is a key. And you sort of hit one key trend that I think is worth talking about. You know, um, I had this discussion with someone, like, I... It, it used to be that the ways that employees got power were through unions, right? And yeah. historically, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I never thought of myself as a union person. <laughs> I never thought of myself as like having to think about structures like that to get something accomplished. But gee, you look a lot at what employees are starting to do in self-organizing in places like Google to drive change. And you're like, hmm, this looks a lot like... <laughs> Okay, let's not call it a union, but let's yeah. start to talk about self-organization to drive change from within and to sort of demand change. And I think um, I think it's one of the ways we're going to see it happen. Well, and I think this just speaks to a colossal failure of leadership in Silicon Valley over the last 50 years. Because when Robert Noyce moved here and started at Fairchild Semiconductor... The whole thinking was he had come from the Midwest, which was union territory, and he had seen how unions pitted employees against their bosses. Mm -hmm. And his whole thing in starting this company, and this was also similar with um, you know, Hewlett and Packard, was let's create a company culture and a way of building companies where unions won't arise because we'll all be on the same page. And this is where management by walking around came up. This is where stock options came up. All of the innovations of what we think about or used to think about as Silicon Valley culture came out of that desire of let's, let's put us all on the same page so that we're out kicking and not fighting against each other. And you know, fast forward 50 or 60 years, and I think the bro economy has just absolutely eradicated that, and he's probably rolling in his grave somewhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't have any data on that, so I'm going to leave that to you. <laughs> You remember I'm an executive at eBay, right? So, <laughs> um, no, in all seriousness, I believe, like Alexis, that, that generally speaking, leaders, myself included, you know, CEOs in the Valley, they're not all malevolently walking around saying, gosh. But some are, let's, let's be just, honest. <laughs> <laughs> let's just... Let's just quash the people. Um, <laughs> I, I, that's not what I believe. Um, but, I, but I will come back to you. I think that asking your organization, I'm in a more serious note, asking your organization to move by data alone without measurement and without repercussion, in all seriousness, even the best intended leaders will not get there. And, and you know, you're painting the extreme picture and I understand why, because mm -hmm. uh, you will make the highlight reel. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, I, but I would argue that I don't think it's as much about intention as willingness to hold accountability and create repercussions, so, you know, for well, so I not having you. a target. I think there are for sure some horrible, horrible sociopathic CEOs in Silicon Valley. But I think they're the outlier. I think the majority, it, you know, we, you know, when I ran Pando, a very fiery investigative journalism outlet, you know, we had a, a saying in house, which is mm -hmm. when a tech company tells you something is too hard, what they're telling you is they don't care. Because this is an industry who has revolutionized industries, who can beam internet down from the sky, who is having serious conversations about colonizing Mars, um, who's connected billions of people in the planet into one social graph. And this is not a place that has ever stopped to say, well, that might be too hard. And I think that's where we come to when it comes to diversity, that it's just not a priority. How do you think we get it to be a priority? The first thing we need is to change diversity from a women's conversation to an everyone conversation. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I applaud the women and men who took their time tonight to be here, but there are far more women than men in this room. And in most rooms where I have the conversation, there are far more women having the conversation. And when you look at the pipeline, you start out with nearly the same number of women and men at entry level. It's not true in tech but it is true broadly in aggregate in the workforce. By the time you get to the C-suite, women make up one in five leaders in the C-suite. That is not enough women, literally not enough women by the numbers to pull all the women up behind them. It cannot be a women's conversation. It must be a talent and leader conversation. 
And many organizations have not made that shift. And until you make that change, there's just no way you can bring that kind of change across your workforce. So how do you want to see the accountability? Do you want companies to set internal quotas? Do you think we need policy? What do you think gets us So there? a lot of companies, we've seen a lot of movement on the policy front. So there's a lo lot of focus on things like, you know, maternity and paternity leave, not to say we don't have a tremendously long way to go in this country on paid leave, but, you know, flex time, telecommuting, lots of experimentation. Certainly that's happening. What we see in the data, though, is that, you know, in the day-to-day -day experience, women and men describe these big disconnects. So companies say, nearly 100% of companies say, when we ask, do you have standard objective criteria you use to evaluate employees? Of course. What company wouldn't? You ask Venture employees. Capital. If you, you ask employees, though, do you see standard objective criteria used in making promotion decisions? That number drops to half. Half of employees say, I don't see that happening day to day. So you have unconscious bias entering into the picture. You have unintended consequences. You have informal networks. And we know that women's networks tend to look very female heavy. Men's networks tend to look very male heavy. That might be fine when you're in your first position yeah. right out of school. Who do you think wins with a network by the time you get to senior leadership? Right? And so companies need to think a lot more rigorously about the things I'm trying to do in, on paper with my policies. Are they showing up? in the day-to-day -day experience, and then use the data to surgically go in and say, it can't be true. If I literally, for every 100 men I jump forward, I only jump 79 women and 60 women of color, I just, I cannot believe that my process is without bias. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hone in there, and then I'm going to hold someone accountable to actually fix it. You know, one of the things that surprised me in reading this study, and this, this happens a lot when I read different studies on how women feel at work, is that some of the numbers feel low to me. Like, I'm surprised only 64% of women think microaggressions are a thing. I'm surprised there's nearly 40% of women who never get talked over, who don't get confused for being the secretary, who don't get asked to make coffee. Like, that, like, like, I would like to know where they work. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised that only 35% have ever heard a sexist joke or sexist comment in the workplace. Like, do you, I, I, legitimately, I am wondering if I have only worked at horrible places, <laughs> or do you think women normalize this and underreport it? Yes. <laughs> yes to both. So TechCrunch yes. was awful, and women normalized <laughs> under board. No. Yes no to the, comment on the first, yes to the second. Uh, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of other signals that suggest we have become far too comfortable with the status quo. Mm -hmm. So the number of times a woman walks, woman walks into the room, this happened to me this morning, and is the only woman, right? 20% of women report that that is a common everyday workplace experience for them. And that number is double for women of color. Mm -hmm. And there is a real psychological and notable cost associated with carrying that burden. Mm -hmm. right? And men just don't experience that. I mean, I've stood with men who walk into a room like this and go, whoa. And I go, this is my every day. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And we see it in other ways. right? When we ask, are women well represented in senior leadership in your company? 43% of men will answer yes to that question when women make up less than one in 10. So we've gotten comfortable that this very uncomfortable inequity is the norm. And if you, if you normalize to that sense, it's very hard to build the burning platform. It's very hard to see when those moments are happening to you, or even more so if they're not directed at you, but they're directed at someone yeah. else, to even notice it's happening at all. Well, it's also really hard to know that this isn't about you, and this isn't about something you did this is about bias. And like, I think that's what was so powerful about the Me Too moment in this country was how many women had been walking around their entire lives thinking, well, I dressed a certain way or I flirted and this was why this happened to me. And then the, the freedom to actually step back and acknowledge, no, this person was just a predator. You know, and it's like there's this trickle down of that. What do you think about this, Sukinder, in terms of women normalizing this behavior? You know, I think so. I think that for sure normalizing happens. I, um, but as I sit here, I, I think about 
sort of obviously my mind always goes to solutions. So I'm like, yes, we can say that the situation is normalized and people don't report microaggressions. But the converse is I think like, well, what is the flip side of that? Like how do you take that feeling and come away from that as somebody who can be empowered in the status quo as opposed to saying, gosh, like where is the where is the positive in all of this? And so I, I mean, yes, I believe that it's true that it's normalized. I mean, I don't even think about being the only woman in a room anymore. I right. often am. It's true. I don't think about it because I'm so used to it. <laughs> and, you know, nobody talks over me because I talk over other people because I'm the CEO. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. <laughs> Somehow I was that aggressive female all the way through. Mm -hmm. So I think that I'm one of those people in the 40%. You're like, who are those 40 percenters? I'm like, ah, oh, I'm the 40 percenter. Like, <laughs> I can't remember somebody talking over me. I think it's the reverse. Um, uh, but in all seriousness, what I think about is, okay, so that may be the status quo that we have normalized this, but it's also a very disempowering place to be. Mm -hmm. So mostly I think about how do we enable conversations that don't put all the power in sort of the hands of leadership to come and fix this multifaceted problem. I think, I think about the women in my organization or women I've worked with or men I've worked with, and mostly I want to figure out how can in the moment that happens, in the moment that yeah. happens, the most powerful place to be is to be able to have a conversation with that other person directly. Because, you know, the power of Me Too is in all of these people speaking up, right? The sadness in all of it is you're speaking up so much after the thing happened because right. there's no ability to speak about it in the moment. Yeah. Sadly, the most empowering place to be for people who are well-intended, men or women, is to be able to speak of it in the moment. So, you know, I understand that, there are, that this has been normalized, but I think what we have to normalize the other way is conversations in the moment about what's happening, you know, for you and taking back some power in that moment. And, and interestingly, it's empowering for the other person, right? To, you know, again, speaking to people, the, ex, uh, the rule, not the exception, I think of all of the people in my organization who are well-intended, who all carry bias, myself included. Yeah. And mostly, I just want to know in that moment if I've done something, mm -hmm. I want to know, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'd love to see us get to that place because it's going to be a long time if we count on all of our leaders to fix these organizations, however well-intended, um, and I think there has to be some personal uh, opportunity for us to change our, our own narrative by taking back these moments. I think you're right. And I think that, that has been happening. But I, I worry when it comes to microaggressions, which, you know, really are the more common mm -hmm. experience yes, more common. that women face rather than the extremes that yes. we saw reported in the Me Too movement. That I feel like that puts such a burden on a young woman in an organization because the thing that's so hard with microaggressions is it's the collective nature of it mm -hmm. that destroys your confidence and beats mm -hmm. you down over time it's not any one thing mm -hmm. and we saw this played out like hugely in the Ellen Powell trial I mean she had pretty conclusive evidence as as far as a pattern of behavior that other women at that firm supported and she could not make a case in a court of law that that was bias, that that was gender-based discrimination. Um, I'm, you know, when we think about sexual harassment, which seems so much more extreme and, and so much easier to, to make a claim against, you know, according to your numbers, 60, only 60% 60 of employees think a sexual harassment claim would be fairly investigated at their company. Just 32% think that would happen quickly. Where does that even put us with microaggressions when even someone who has the money and the resources and reach of an Alan Powell cannot, and that stuff documented, cannot make her case? I mean, girlfriend is getting her show made by Shonda Rhimes on Netflix, and she still didn't win the case. Like, how do we, how do you not be the young buzzkill in the room? How do you not suffer the ramifications of being like, excuse me, that was my idea, you just talked over me, and doing that day after day after day to take those moments. Yeah. Well, let's let's define first what we mean by microaggression so everyone's on the same page about it. They're the types of, just as you said, small moments, I believe in most cases um, come out of a space of lack of awareness and understanding more than intentional actions uh, of, of power imbalance or um, disempowerment. But they are things like 
um, being, being talked over, having your work credited to someone else, having to credential yourself um, and show proof of your expertise, um, being, uh, being confused for someone more junior, uh, for someone in a support role when you're in a, um, in a line or leading role, all of these sort of little moments that I see a lot of nodding around the room. We see experiencing, and what we see consistently is just as you noted, women cite that happening more frequently. Women of color cite it even more frequently. More senior women cite it even more. Women in technical roles cite it even more. Lesbian women even more. The more different you are than the white male, the more you experience this over and over again. And the reason it matters so much is that um, it consumes your time and energy, it undermines your self-confidence, and we see twice, twice as frequently women who cite uh, experiencing these things often in the workplace think about leaving. Um, and in particular, not leaving to drop out in the public yeah. narrative, leaving to do their own thing, leaving to found their own company where the money is not waiting for them <laughs> as much as it should be, right? And so uh, the important thing here, though, is I truly believe that most of this is not intentional and that what's required is, just as you said, the transparency and the conversation. And what most people describe is, I don't have the tools to have that conversation. The average manager, when asked, do you know, are you committed to gender diversity? Yes. Do you know what to do to help drive it? No idea. And you think about the moments, it makes sense, because somebody, you know, this happened to me. I was on stage once presenting, and my co-presenter was a man. Uh, I was mid-sentence talking about the research, interrupts me to start explaining why the tech industry was going to solve all this by being a new generation of companies that were so much better about gender. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then turned to me and said, could you get me some water? Mm. And, I, and I'm literally on stage and I thought, hmm. You know, so I could be like, well, actually what I did was I went, hmm. And I didn't, and someone ran from the side and brought him water. But, you, you know, do you want to make that a teachable moment? Absolutely. Uh. Did I on stage choose to make it a teachable moment? No. And think about that in the context of the uh, average company environment. Do you call someone out? You need to call them out because if you don't, it looks like it's okay. But yeah. if you do, what's the dynamic you've now created in the room? And is everybody prepared for that dynamic and have the skills to address? I feel like I call it out 60% of the time and I'm the world's biggest buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like it is impossible to call it 100% of the time. Like, I, I think, especially as a young woman, woman or a young woman of color or a young lesbian woman in a company that is already facing all of that pressure to be cool and be one of the guys and not be a buzzkill, like, how would you, if a young mentor came to you, how would you tell her to handle yeah, that? You know, the truth is I would say pick your battles. That is true. I mean, pragmatically speaking, I would say you can't let it happen every time. Mm -hmm. You've got to pick the moments when it matters, right? And... and and, and to find your power in that moment in a constructive way, because all of those things you're saying are true. You know, you do it in public too often, it does have a ramification. You don't do it, it has a ramification on you, mm -hmm. right? By the way, it has a ramification on the other well-intended person who doesn't ever get the benefit of understanding, right? And because five or six points of understanding may be enough for that person to change their behavior with the next uh, uh, sort of uh, diverse person they encounter in a diverse situation. So. So look, I, if, if a young woman came to me or a person of color, I would say, I'd say, yeah, you've got to find your moment. I would say, pick your moments. I would say, practice, 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 mm -hmm. practice. Yeah. Honestly, when you talk about tools, I'd be like, go have a conversation, like have this conversation five times with your best friend or, you know, or somebody in the organization you trust. Practice so you, when you say it, you don't cry. That's what I would, I would be like, because yeah. I remember myself, I'd be like, oh my God, if somebody asked me to tell my boss, yeah. you know, uh, or somebody who kind of was a peer who did something. But I, but yeah, I think you do. I mean, it is true that there are microaggressions. It is true that it's draining. It's also true that if you don't and we don't take those moments, nothing ever changes. So right. it does take courage, um, but it also takes demystifying it. I'm yeah. telling you, we have to demystify giving people feedback. And it's really freaking hard. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be the person giving a colleague feedback, right? I mean, it yeah. does. So it's not easy, and we can demystify it. And I think we have no choice but to do that. Right. And let me add one to that, which is um, rally the people around you. It is so mm -hmm. much easier to be the third uh, party. That's a great point. Yeah. Observe the moment and say, can I take a time out here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or... 
uh, what what I've often seen is when we'll say, oh, yeah, good point. You mean the one that she just made? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. There are, there are artful ways to do that. You don't always leave it in particular to the woman in the moment. Experiencing it. Experiencing, Experiencing it. it. I think that's To have to true. always be her own champion. Because to your point, it, it is exhausting. And in particular, men, but anyone at the table observing these Jesus. things, if we have our radar up, we can all be the champion. Yeah. yeah. And that's, we, I think that's you know, a great point. On, um, on my community, Chairman Mom, it's basically a platform, subscription-based, no trolls, no bots, where women can ask advice on the hardest problems they face. And this comes up all the time because every woman in a job in America is dealing with some version of this. And a lot of the advice has been, you know, jump in and defend someone else, you know, before it's, you know, happens to you. Or, um, But I think another one is, like, pull the person out of the room and have a one-on-one conversation exactly. with it, which makes a lot of sense. Because a lot of times if you bring it up in the moment in a meeting, yeah. you're then, there's this compound of you've embarrassed that person in front of everyone else. And if it is unintentional, and this is one of these people who is like hashtag feminist in their Twitter bio, it's like <laughs> then they're upset and they're triggered and they're embarrassed. Whereas it's like if you take them aside and have it one-on-one, it's like there's there's a couple tactics for for being able to have a better outcome. But... It is an exhausting, ta- it's an exhausting tax for me as a white woman. I can't imagine what it must feel like as a woman of color. Yes. Um, By the way, I don't I say that about myself. I know. I'm like, I say it as if I, I, I am a woman of color in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> but in the Silicon Valley definition, I'm actually not a woman of color because Asian women generally have more opportunity, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, so I say it more empathetically. Uh, because I do think my experience is different than people of uh, color or Hispanic or African American. Right. So there's a lot in this study that, particularly for women in my network, really caught their attention about being the only. Yeah. You know, we focus so much on having, let's get a woman on the board, let's get a woman on the C-suite. And a lot of what I think was really groundbreaking in this study was how you looked at what being that only person was. And this is something I've looked at a lot of research on because, you know, every time I talk to a corporate group about these issues, there's always young women who want to bring up like, you know, catty women and queen being at companies. And there's a lot of data that shows that that happens when there's one woman at the C-suite, when it's when it's been telegraphed to women that one whim- woman will have a slot to the top at this company, and then it turns it into kind of a Hunger Games situation. <laughs> um, but, um, and so I always say like, you know, pull back and look at the trauma of that woman, like, and let's all like just be friends and get together and look at the system we're all in. Um, but you guys, you know, really took that, that experience of being the only in some, some areas that I haven't seen research, um, you know, both in terms of how much more threatening women become when they're the only and, and how much more they experience. And, you know, a couple of things I want to read for those of you who don't have the study or may not have looked at it. Um, th- this is actually about um, women experiencing sexual harassment. Um, 55% of women in senior liter- leadership 48% of lesbian women, 48% of women in technical fields report they've been sexually harassed. All of those three groups are higher than the norm because those are women that stand out and aren't playing the role they're supposed to be playing in society. A common thread that connects these groups, researchers found that women who do not conform to traditional feminine expectations, in this case, by holding authority, not being heterosexual and working in fields dominated by men are more often the targets of sexual harassment. And more to the point of onlys, um, over eighty percent over eighty percent are on the t- are on the receiving end of microaggressions compared to sixty four percent of women as a whole. They are more likely to have their abilities challenged, to be subject to unprofessional and demeaning remarks, to feel like they cannot talk about their personal lives at work. Most notably, onlys are almost twice as likely to have been sexually harassed at some point in their careers. And what I find fascinating about this is it it speaks to something more insidious than unconscious bias. I think of unconscious bias as frequently saying, you know, in my weird lizard brain, I don't think this young, you know, this young African-American woman is the kind of person who looks like a central casting founder dropout that I should fund. So, you know, let's let her prove it. And then she goes and proves herself. She gets to those highest levels and then she experiences more sexism. 
as a result of having proved herself. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, where this, frankly, to me, reading this data gets scarier for women. What it suggests to me is how critical the imperative is to keep pushing for way more change, way more quickly. Because so many companies, I believe, are saying, hey, we got a woman into the C-suite. Oh, we, we know one who's a CEO. We're, you know, we're good. And they're, they're missing this entire fact that there is a cost to trying to represent 50% of the human population when you are the only one sitting at the table. It's an unbelievable burden to put on any woman. And you take an African-American woman, a Hispanic woman, and ask them to do the same even more so for not only their gender but their entire race. And we know from research that you are judged, your comments are judged and taken in the context, not just of you as an individual who has a point of view as a business leader, but as a whole category. So you suddenly represent in your choices that you're making, whether you defend someone or you don't defend someone, you stand up for the woman and advocate who's the next one on the path that's being discussed in the room, or you don't. That's interesting, she didn't do it. Oh, she did because it's about gender. I mean, this whole context of judgment that comes around your choices and the decisions you're trying to make suddenly become far more loaded. Mm -hmm. And that's what women describe when they're in this experience. They describe the sensation of feeling on guard they describe the sense that they're trying to represent an entire body and it's an unbelievably and un unbearable task. Mm -hmm. And I do think it, it forces you to at the same time conform and show a breadth of diversity that is impossible for one single individual, any individual to try and bring to the table every day in every moment. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that what that butts up against then is a whole set of, um, norms that other people around that table will have in their head about what you should or shouldn't be doing, what you should or shouldn't be saying, and judgments they're bringing, right, that I think are more likely than to put you in the line of fire for everything from microaggressions to, you know, the overt and intentional form of sexual harassment. Right. So, Kinder, what are your thoughts on this as a woman who's had a stellar career in Silicon Valley? As you've been more successful, have you experienced things that you didn't when you were younger? Uh, I don't, I don't think, I think I've experienced different forms of mm -hmm. discrimination, right? I mean, so I've had it throughout my career, um, in actually, I would say small doses. I actually can't think of a macro aggression, honestly. Um, and I just think the nature of it's changed. So I, but mostly what I think is what you identified, which is as the only person in the room, there are times I don't notice it at all. And then I would say the place I really notice interestingly is when I've been the only person in a boardroom where I've been in boardrooms that are completely gender uh, diverse. And I've been in boardrooms where I am the only woman and there is a stark difference. So more than in my day job, interestingly, I feel like I have noticed a difference in the boardroom. And I think, and the difference for me is, is very clear. When you're alone, you do feel like the single female voice. You do feel like everything you say is somehow on the other, uh, other side being judged by, you know, uh, by others as being the female voice. I don't know why I feel that way, but I do. My, uh, my comments in a boardroom where I was the only woman often end more with a question mark as opposed to, you know, like asserting my opinion. Uh, and it's, it's my own reaction to that situation as well as um, how I perceive that I'm judged for everything I say. And, and, and then I think about gender balance boards I've been in, and I just, honestly, my gender ceases to be an issue. And it's a really liberating place to be. Like someone's just speaking. And because the room is so diverse, you're not, you don't even really notice if it's a man or a woman. Someone is speaking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the magical thing that happens when you're not at even one or two, but at three, right? And I mean, yeah. research shows that three and above, you cease being the woman or the women in the room. And you are simply the leader in the room. So I certainly feel like I've experienced um, things over my career, but that's one of the things that really stands out for me on sort of the onlys topic. That's interesting. So I think we're getting really close to Q&A. Um, I see like a marker board coming my way. Um, so I think there's going to be a microphone at the back of the room if anyone is like dying for questions and wants to start lining up. Um, I had like three 
awesome questions and I've like, like picked We just want to be off the hook. Point. Can we go to audience questions? No. Right no. Oh my God. Have you seen my interviews on YouTube? I've been so nice to you guys. You have been. Um, you have been. This is nice for me. Um, so, okay. I want to, this is, this is the one of the three I'm picking. Um, I, we are in Silicon Valley, right? And this is the venture capital center of the world. And we met, I mentioned earlier that, you know, this is an industry where only two female founders, female CEOs rather, only get 2.2% of the money. You know, you, you talked about earlier tonight and you wrote about in this survey, you know, the number one advice other than set goals is have, you know, things written down that are your qualities for hiring people that you can measure against when you're going through that process or why you're going to promote someone or why you're going to give them a raise that you can measure against as a check against unconscious bias. We are in an industry that believes there is a divine gut of venture capitalists and they don't ever have to measure someone against metrics, against this is what I look for to invest, and that that is the magic of the industry, and that the magic of the industry is pattern recognition, which many people consider the opposite, you know, the enabler, rather, of unconscious bias. You know, and he, as bad as the numbers are in a lot of the industry, you know, we have this symmetry where 98% of the people writing the checks are white or Asian men, and 2% of the money is going to women. There is obviously something about that gut feeling that has to do with race and gender. So how do you, I know you're working with HR departments and people who are held accountable. Do you think the startup industry and the venture industry is just screwed? <laughs> are you sure you don't want to take this? <laughs> as soon as you're done, I'm happy to take it. <laughs> you go first, so, by all means. Um, so what do I think? I think we need to demand accountability from all angles. And so I think that starts with where does that money come from? That comes from LPs, that comes from funds. You can and you're starting to see agitation for change and a demand for more diversity in those teams. I think it will require equally on, on the back end of performance, more transparency into who's bringing real results. What does the data say? And what our own data says about diversity, both gender and race, is that when you track it in companies, larger companies that are public where the information is easily accessible, it drives financial performance results. You have more diversity in your leadership team and on your board. You are 25% more likely if you have gender diversity to have uh, above average EBITDA performance and over 35% 35 per, 35 more likely uh, to have it if you have racial diversity. It's real hard numbers. And I think we need more proof points of that. Um, and then frankly, we need more women like you are saying, screw it, I don't care what the environment says. Somebody out there is gonna know that the arbitrage, yeah. everybody's fishing in one pond and I'm over here and I'm gonna find somebody to back me and chances are I'm a much better bet. Mm -hmm. You've worked in the startup space, you do investing. Yeah, do so look, this? I think on this one, um, I, you know, because I've long lived in sort of startup but then corporate ecosystems, I sort of feel like with corporations I see intention, okay? And the check and balance there is they're all in a global fight for talent. Right. So when their employees are demanding new conditions or they're thinking about how to grow their own workforce, whether they're getting to the right results, they're thinking about it because they have to. It's in their critical path. I think venture is a much more difficult and, quite frankly, depressing situation because Agreed. you have small systems with basically unchecked power that really and have frequently right. no internal HR. And sort of my, and, and, and unregulated. Uh, don't feel like they need to get critical mass of talent. They think they need to get critical mass of founders, but again, they. Mm -hmm. They sort of rely on this thing called the gut feel, and they are not checked. They don't have a board or governing body. Their limiteds are sort of hands off. So I actually think that is a much more dire situation, to be, to be honest. I mean, um, because I don't see the same level of intention there. Yeah. I mean, with corporates, we can talk, I see intention, I don't see results. I do see intention, and again, I think it's I because agree. we have a capitalist society where everybody understands that we all live on talent, and we're all trying to get access to, to great talent. Um, uh, and we're being held accountable on all sides, but uh, even though we should be more. But venture, venture, unless limiteds, 
step up, I mean truly step up and demand data, transparency, accountability, you know, measurement by the numbers, you know, women uh, venture partners who are then measured on their success as well. I mean, yeah, we need limited partners to step the hell up now. I have nothing more to say that could top that <laughs> <laughs> as a woman raising money. Um, all right, we're going to go to audience Q&A right now. Um, just a friendly reminder. Let's try to get as many questions as possible. So keep your questions short and ending with question marks, as we heard earlier and is written in my script. Um, <laughs> what, is, what would you like to ask uh, Alexis and Sukinder? Go ahead. All right. Thank you. My name is Chanel Reese, and I am an executive at a tech company here in San Francisco. And in many instances in my experiences or my past jobs, I am the only woman, not only of color within the company, but definitely at the executive level. My question is going back to what we were talking about, about microaggressions and how some of uh, you felt it was a result of lack of education or knowledge. Um, and I, I kind of disagree with that because when I've checked microaggressions, it has been a culture of not being checked, and so people feel free to do it, not necessarily that people don't know better. So my question to you is, do you feel like we're letting people off the hook um, for the microaggressions that they, um, you know, that, that we see happening within organizations? Because as typically the only one woman of color on the executive team, is very difficult to check those behaviors when a lot of times they affect you personally. So I would ask that I had more allies in the women that are not necessarily of color and even of the men in the organizations. So are we doing ourselves a disservice by not checking those and assuming people don't know, so we let it slide? Should we be more assertive in our checking of those microaggressions? That's a great question. Great, great question, great point. Um, certainly wholeheartedly agree that in many cases this comes down to culture. Um, and the type of expectations and norms that you set in an organization. And we certainly see there is a flywheel, and that can be a positive or a negative flywheel. And in companies where this is rampant behavior, very often it's because they have cultivated, in some cases, seemingly intentionally, but a culture that is permissive at best and, you know, at worst um, misogynistic, right, in how they treat um, entire categories of their own employees, women, um, in particular women of color, uh, but also um, also anyone else who doesn't feel like the status quo and the norm. Um, certainly where I've spent time with companies that are really working on change, one of the things we anchor on is overall culture, right? What, what, is, the, what is the currency of what you reward? What is the currency of what gets you in on the inside? And, these, and, and what are the signals you're sending in all the moments that people are watching that get amplified around the organization? And so to give just one example, I was with an executive who said, oh, I, you know, I mentor and support all sorts of people. I, you know, I sit down with women, I go to coffee, I do poker games with the guys, I do, and I go, whoa, 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 what do you mean poker games with the guys? Well, we go out at night and we do poker games. I said, well, do women go to that? No. Well, do you invite women? Well, that seems a little weird. Don't do an <laughs> event <laughs> with the men in your company you would not want to do with the young women. Because you have then created- it's weird for everyone. Yeah, because you've created an imbalance that they will not be able to surpass. And you forced the, the burden on now the woman to say, hey, could I come to your Saturday night poker game? <laughs> and now that's weird, right? And so I, I, think there's, <laughs> I think there's a ton about culture. I think you're absolutely right. Hello. Um, you alluded to it earlier. Um, Silicon Valley is arguably having a bit of an activist moment right now um, with the Google walkout. Me Too is obviously having an influence. How much, and they've extracted some kind of minor concessions, perhaps we might say, how much do you think uh, employees can move the dial on this? How much of a meaningful uh, c contribution can they make? Um, and if they can make a contribution going forward, what, what can they do? What can we do to keep that momentum going? I think they're the only ones who can. I think it doesn't work for Wall Street when you're talking about the big companies, and I think consumers don't care. I think it's only employees who have power right now. I don't know if you guys agree, disagree. Yeah, I, 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 I think employees actually have a, have a lot of power. And I, think, and I think collective voice, you know, and bringing together kind of 
uh, patterns, <laughs> particularly when you have the benefit of having a lot of people who, have, who are diverse people with similar experiences. I think it's a moment, and I think the key thing in this moment is when you're seeing success, not to come off of it and make it a one-off, because I think that the power is in being consistent. This is going to take a long time. So I'm with you. I actually think that uh, the voice of employees is one of the most powerful things that can happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think everybody was surprised to the positive that, you know, what started out with seven women at Google was yeah. 15,000 people, 15,000, 20,000 men at the and talent. women. They're not going to fire all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Alexis, do you have any thoughts? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lindsay. Uh, my question is for you is how has uh, studies like this actually changed your leadership style personally? Mm. So uh, uh, this research is a, is a bit of a side project for me at McKinsey, a big one, <laughs> but a side project. And uh, the reason that I took it on was because I went to a partner meeting and I looked around the room and I said, we could do so much better. And I thought that uh, by this time, it would already be done. And because I graduated from Stanford and my class was just like you know, the general rule of thumb, more than 50% women. I entered the workforce with an analyst class that was 50% women. And I thought, and when I looked at leadership that wasn't yet diverse across most companies, I said, well, we just haven't gotten there yet. We're coming. And then I got there and I went, where did they all go? And I, uh, you know, I have three young daughters at home. And my husband's here tonight. And so is my mom. And I don't want them to have the same experience where they show up and go, oh, we just haven't arrived yet. When we arrive, it'll be taken care of, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's just critically important that we're all finding a way to use the power we have, whether it's the power that comes from leadership or as the individual employee that starts the movement or the person who champions for someone else so they don't always have to do it on their own behalf to keep pressing on this issue. And the way I do it is by bringing the data to the table. You know, you do it by bringing a community together and you represent in leadership and in boardrooms mm -hmm. what it looks like and the power of having that diversity. I mean, my big thing for me is it's just made, it hammered home the importance of intersectionality. Like, as a white woman, I'm really pissed off that 98% of the venture money goes to men. But African-American women do not register a percentage point. The level of privilege that I have over other groups that are even more only, like to me the data is just like, that's what it hammered home to me as like a leader and as someone hiring, as someone building a company, is how important like as, as aggrieved as white women are and like we deal with a lot, but it's like we got to really think about how much privilege we have and how to lift up everyone if we want equality at all. Do you have a thought on that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say less the McKinsey study, no offense, <laughs> uh, but more the last several years, I think I just went from probably the classic kind of path that a lot of people in this room have been on for thinking um, my contribution was it was enough if I was just a role model, right? Like, okay, if I am good at my job and um, then maybe that's enough to have an impact to feeling like, oh, I have a unique perspective on this topic. And rather than thinking that I'm best served by just putting my head down and doing my job well, maybe I'm best served to use my voice, um, you know, uh, more broadly on this topic. So that was sort of my first evolution. And I would say the second one is the one you identified, which is I honestly, and please don't take it a this a bad way. I just, I honestly just thought of women and uh, diverse people as a class without thinking about, you know, honestly, how much worse it is if you are a person of color or you're African-American and you bad statement, <laughs> African-American or Hispanic or, but just the same idea. Yeah. Like I, I, I don't think I, I think I just generalized. I think I was like, oh yes, this is all of a kind and it's really not. And I would just say that's more in the last year or so, you know, as I started the board list. And, um, I think early on someone said to us, well, your criteria itself is biased towards white women. And I didn't even really think about that. Right. I'd start it with good intention and just looking at that. So I'd say for me, it's been like layers of an onion where I like, I feel like I get a new insight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and it's just been a journey. 
um, that's more how it's evolved for me. And I will say, I was really happy to see all of like the research that you did about like you know, lesbian women in the study. I hope in the future you guys will look at trans women because I think that's still a really overlooked place. We we are looking at it, um, and what we need is more data to be able to do the type of deeper look we want to, which means yeah. we need more companies to participate. So, <laughs> All right, next question. Hi, I'm Barbara Mark, and thank you so much for this. It's informative. Um, would you comment on gendered ageism in the workplace, please? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the collective sigh of, yes, that's an even bigger problem we don't talk about. I think it's a I'll bigger problem. It. it is. It's a bigger problem. Ageism on both sides, but yeah. again, double whammy. I feel like the tech go. industry is ramp with ageism. Oh, my goodness. Like, you talk about pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is, like, you need to be under 30, preferably under 20. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, don't bother showing up and asking for money. Yeah. Um, We're all targets of ageism as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I actually, I, I, I think you're spot on. Oh. I think the, I mean, there's so many intersections here, but intersection of uh, gender and age is a difficult one. I mean, I don't know what else to say, but I violently agree that it's a big issue. Is that something you guys have looked at in your research? Do you think it's harder to combat than just gender? Uh, so we have looked at the question of age, and in particular, we've looked a lot at the questions of um, where do we see evolution in the, in the mindset and the view about the importance of diversity, what it's going to take, the role of men and women um, having equal, equal roles in the workplace, and something we haven't talked about here, but equal roles at home. And there are some changes that we see uh, that are important, right, that show that younger men are moving more in the direction of viewing diversity as something that's important. Women are already there at all levels, right? Um, but it's, it's difficult to pinpoint and separate is the, is in the data, is the ex experience of older women in particular something unique in terms of how their intersection of age and gender is showing up, in part because at this point where most women are sitting effectively, for better or worse, at, you know, at the stage where you're in the last 10, 15 years of your career, in most cases for women, they've, they've actually what we call settled into the pipeline. They're kind of where they're going to be from a career standpoint. And so we've looked at these cuts where it basically shows for men, it's sort of this continual hockey stick a rise that continues mm. as long as you've got the ambition, the opportunity do doors continue to open in front of you. And for women, because that trajectory is so much slower, those first promotions take so much longer for all the reasons we talked about already. By the time you're later in your career, you've, you know, you don't see that hockey stick. You see sort of like a, a bell curve, you settle in the middle. And so it's, I, I believe it's a really critical issue. Um, I will say to solve for women in the workplace, um, we have to solve for our expectations of women at home. And I know it's not uh, the question you asked here, but women are doing a double shift. They yeah. are doing a double shift, and we see it in the data. Um, everything from senior women are twice as likely to be in a dual career household with a full working spouse, if they have a full working, if they have a spouse, um, than men are, to just how much work and expectations they hold as a burden. And the fact that even when women are the primary breadwinner, they are still more likely to be doing the majority of work at home. Oh, it's worse than that. And I'm just gonna jump in. It's, I will like data one up you right now. It is not only that bad. If a woman out earns her spouse by just a dollar, her percentage of the household load she carries goes up from the normal imbalance. And the odds of his infidelity goes up the more economically dependent he is on his wife. Okay, I didn't track that one. <laughs> It gets worse. This will be our last audience question. <laughs> She's like, please leave. <laughs> Hi, hello, I'm Reverend Charlotte Myers, and I have a question. Um, why is it that you are thinking that power is going to concede without a challenge? Uh, if there must, there have to be consequences to being non-compliant. A power, there is a very famous statement that comes from Frederick Douglass that says, you cannot have the ocean without the roar of the waves. So assuming that people who hold power are going to concede it 
without a challenge and without, and just because they are benevolent is a mistake. It just makes us appear like victims. I, I totally agree. I think when we started, at least my belief is, data alone will not get done. I think repercussions, disruption, some of the things we've chatted about are, are definitely accelerators of change. So I don't disagree that we should just wait for people to give us what we want. Well, and I totally agree. And one of the things that I wanted to bring up before I got ran out of time is, you know, you guys note as one of your recommendations going forward, and there's a lot of amazing recommendations of how to go forward, is to make senior leaders and managers champions of diversity. Can we make people champions of things they don't care about? Well, so I would, I, I don't know, I would disagree somewhat um, in that I think there's a very clear data-driven case that diversity drives long-term performance. There is also very clear talent case that if everyone is fishing in one pond, you have differential opportunity if you can figure out how to identify that great talent that other people are overlooking. And I think for many companies, there's a customer-driven case that says, how will I ever meet the vast majority of customers out there who look increasingly diverse if I don't have anyone in my company who looks like them? And I think there's a whole set of companies that are waking up to this and realizing if I can actually move on this when others don't, I will have an advantage. And but I like how long is your advantage. snooze alarm? Because this has been going on for five yeah. years. And I would just say to come back, I I again, I, I'm more of I think people are well intentioned, but until there's a forcing function, I don't know that I agree. I mean, I think yes, people want to be customer centric, but it's not until a public company maybe starts to lose market share to a competitor that has a millennial customer or has a better, more Gender empowering brand Bumble. for women that maybe they wake up and say, gee, I'm missing the voice of the customer in the room. So I wish it was data alone. I. Like no, my, I'm not saying yes. it's data alone. I mean, let or me be clear. Yes. I don't think or it's a data. case. A case. <laughs> I think we need. I think we need data to help inform the conversation we're having to to make it less threatening and show in clear, stark terms, you know, where we're sitting today and how far we are from where we need to go. Uh, but I, f I fundamentally believe that there's just tremendous potential that companies are leaving on the table, and increasingly they're starting to see that. What they don't yet know is what are the specific actions I need to be taking because you know, I'm clearly missing the mark today to go seize that opportunity. But I, I don't believe it's zero sum. I believe there's a win-win. So I agree with you a thousand percent. They're leaving money on the table. I think all data shows that. I think we everyone in this room agrees with that. I have looked Silicon Valley CEOs in the face in the last two years and asked this question of them, why you say you listen to data and haven't been listening to data. And the most honest answer I got was from someone who said, look, I'm looking at comp companies like Apple and Google and Facebook who data says are horrible with diversity and I can't imagine them being not being better. I have heard from founders they don't believe the data. So I think we need more than data and I'm with you. I don't think they cede power. But I think the data is super important to make this argument because I think it, well, and that's not just disingenuous because most people who follow me know I'm not nice to people. But like, uh, no, but I think, the, I think the reason the data is so important and the reason I love the work that you guys have been doing and so many others have been doing on this topic for five years is without the data, we can't expose the bias. Mm -hmm. You need the foundation. data to expose the bias, yeah. but then we got to deal with the bias. Yeah, yeah data is the foundation. I'm told we're over time. <laughs> um, it is now an Inforum tradition to ask all of our speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Me first. Sure. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna save us time and I'll keep it even shorter than that. Um, radical transparency, bring it and demand it. Okay. Good one. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I think it actually goes back to what we were talking about today. I think if you want to change the world, take an opportunity to pull in any conversation you're in, pull in two to three diverse perspectives. Yeah. Generously defined. Age, gender, experience, 
uh, customer mindset, employee mindset. Like, imagine what happens if you bring along two or three diverse perspectives mm -hmm. in every conversation that you're the privilege, you have the privilege of being in. And I'll add to that as a complimentary, if you are an only, or if you're a one or two, regularly get together with people like you once a month to compare notes and figure out how much you're all experiencing the same stuff. And let that distill for you that frequently it's not about you, it's about bias. I mean, Gloria Steinem once said, and this is the underpinning of Chairman Mom, every social revolution is started by small groups of people getting together and figuring out how similar their situations are. So in closing, let's give a big round of applause to Alexis Kovitch and Sikinder Singh Cassidy. I'm Sarah Lacey, and thank you for joining us tonight at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Have a great evening. Yeah.